Hello, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Cadet Third Class Hillary Tran, and I am your Master of Ceremonies for today. It is my privilege to welcome you to, the, to this NCLS event that wraps up the 2022 theme of Ethics and Respect for Human Dignity and kicks off our theme for NCLS 2023. <laughs> Leadership, teamwork, and organizational management. Our panelists today are excited to share their personal stories with us. First, retired Air Force Lieutenant Colonel Kevin Basic, who currently serves as the president of Basic Insight and a company dedicated to energizing, enlightening, and equipping organizations to lead with character with a focus on leadership development. Kevin served for 24 years, including assignments at USAFA and headquarters, uh, ROTC. Recently, Kevin was named the first program director for the new National Medal of Honor Leadership Institute. Kevin is a proud member of the class of 93, and a fun fact about Kevin includes being voted the guy who looked the worst in his class cover baseball cap. <laughs> <laughs> Our second panelist is retired Navy Captain Chris Cassidy who currently serves as the president and CEO of the National Medal of Honor Museum. Fun facts about Chris include serving as a Navy SEAL and a NASA astronaut, completing three space flights, a stint at the commander of the International Space Station during the COVID pandemic, and spending a total of 377 days in space. He was the second Navy SEAL to fly in space, earning the distinction as the 500th person in space. Chris graduated from the U.S. Naval Academy with the class of 93, but don't let this fool you. <laughs> he chose to get a break from the Navy to do a semester exchange here with Squad 4. <laughs> Our panelists are joined by Cadet Second Class Anna Little, your moderator for this panel. Anna, over to you. Thank you, Hillary, and thank you everyone for joining us here today. Um, so when we reached out to today's uh, speakers, who are both Service Academy graduates, and invited them to this session, they told us that they really wanted to change up the format that we typically know for M5s. So rather than that, we're going to go with um, some cool leadership stories, important stories that we think have real-world applications that cadets need to know. Because we think that stories beat speeches, uh, so that's what we're going to do. Three cool stories and then a few nuggets of wisdom from the real world. And another weird thing that they've asked me to do is to use their first names. So odd, I know. But they wanted me to highlight that these are lessons from people just like you and me. And we might find ourselves in these unique circumstances as well. So it is just as odd for me to do as it is for you to hear. But it's what they asked for. And, and let's point this out in that, hey, in the introductions, and one interesting thing about Kevin, he looks like an idiot in a class colored baseball cap. One interesting thing about Chris is he walked in space. So how's that feel <laughs> in this? Okay, just want to put that on the table. It's, it's not to undermine that Kevin has yeah. some pretty good stories himself, but. Thanks for help, but I, I, for helping. I look silly with my space helmet on. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> so I guess we should probably get into those leadership stories, huh? Um, once we finish it, the stories that they have to tell us, then we're going to open the floor for questions. So be thinking of what you want to ask them as we go along. Captain Chris, we're really excited to hear about your time deployed as a Navy SEAL. So do you think you could start off with the story about your time in Kandahar? Oh, yeah, sure. I'm, I'm, I'm uh, happy to do that. And first of all, thanks. It's wonderful to be back here. I think the fall of 1992 was the last time I was on the campus here. And, it, and some things have changed, and, and others haven't. And the sense of humor in, uh, in the, with, the, with the group and the cadets hasn't changed one bit. So it's glad to be back. But keep trying. Okay, I'll keep <laughs> trying. Um, so what Kevin and I thought would resonate most loudly is, and it does with us as well when we're in the audience, are, are some stories. And, and we've got a few of them to share with you today that have been impactful in both of our lives. And, have, and for me, this first one is something that has carried with me ever since it happened all the way to today. And uh, just like you guys, when I was a, a midshipman at Navy and here for this semester, 
you know, you go through a lot, you hear lots of lectures, you could do, at, at, at Annapolis, it's Loose Hall, that's where you sit and you listen to your leadership classes and, and whatnot, and I had all of those things, but it takes a series of, of, of experiences to pull things together and really have the light bulb click for you. And for me, um, I selected SEAL teams right out of the academy, did a, a few years at driving mini submarines, and then uh, found myself after grad, grad school assigned to SEAL Team 3. And SEAL Team 3 at that time was responsible to cover the Middle East. Each SEAL team was kind of given a geographic area of responsibility in the country. And I was, happened to be a platoon commander at SEAL Team 3. We were getting ready to do our normal six-month scheduled de deployment around Thanksgiving time of 2001. And then all of a sudden, September 11th of 2001 happened. And we just by chance were the SEAL platoon that was most ready to deploy with the area of responsibility of that part of the world. So we packed up our gear, and within a couple weeks we were off and um, didn't land directly in Kandahar. It was a, a bit of a logistics process to get there, but within a few weeks, there we are in Kandahar, Afghanistan. Very, very basic um, facility at that time. Not a lot of infrastructure there. And we were given a mission to go on the Afghan-Pakistan border to this known cave complex called the Zawar Keeley Caves. And you guys might not remember, you might be too young, but there was an area called Tora Bora, which we as a country knew that bin Laden was located there and he was fleeing out of that region. And this cave complex was, was known to have just a, um, a stockpile of munitions, an area where the Taliban and Al Qaeda could hang out and, and, and refit and regroup. Uh, and that sort of thing. So that was our objective, to go to this cave complex. We were given the mission tasking, and generally, and you guys will find this out as you get into your careers, you, when you get a mission, sometimes you have a little more time, a little less time to plan and prepare. We had about 48 hours for this particular mission to get our act together and pull together the overall scheme and to coordinate with the other units and kind of figure out what we were going to do. And in that 48 hours, we were given this Little green tent, um, kind of smelled mildewy like a typical army tent that just got pulled out of some Connex box somewhere. In the back, you know, maps and charts and a little sand table up at the front where we had G.I. Joe guys where we could do our schematics. And um, it was a blur of those 48 hours leading up to the briefing where we had to, to give the briefing to this guy named Captain Harwood. Captain Harwood was a Navy Captain SEAL G.I. Joe scar on his face, really mean. He never smiled. He was a real kind of a tough guy to work for and to get to know. Um, but he expected a lot out of everybody that briefed him. And he was known for just like eating and chewing up young O3s and E7s who were briefing him and spitting them right back at you. So we knew this. And, and the platoon were in this tent for the butter part of these 48 hours. We had this plan really, really dialed in, we, we felt, and now it's time for the give the brief. And I'm the platoon commander, I give the brief, um, and different folks are giving their part, the intelligence brief, the coordinating air plan, and these other things. He had a few questions along the way, which we felt generally were fairly easy, uh, and we had the answer in our hip pocket, and we went right back at him. And, and after he's felt a little comfortable with us, he said, okay, all right, guys, go do the mission. I'm like, Here's me. Yes, yeah, score. All right. That's, a, that's as best of a home run as we're going to get from Captain Harwood. Everybody starts leaving the tent. I'm the last one in there. I roll up the maps on my arm, kind of make desanitize the place, and flip off the one light bulb that's kind of dangling from a string in the middle of the tent. And at the time, the bathroom in, in, uh, uh, at Kandahar was a trench dug in the ground with two four by four fo posts. You guys know what those are, wooden posts that you might build a deck out of, suspended over the, the trench, and then three tires just pushed together over those two pieces of wood. That was the bathroom. And then there was uh, three sides of plywood giving you privacy, <laughs> and then the open side facing the runway that that's what you got to look at, planes landing and coming <laughs> as you're doing your business. So I'm walking out of the tent. I look at my watch and I've got like maybe 36, 37 minutes till I have to be on the helicopter and I need, I need to go to the bathroom, number one and two, I need to eat, I need to gather my gear and I gotta get on the helicopter, all in 36 minutes, 37 minutes. 
So I'm going to go to the bathroom first. I round the corner. And at this time in Kandahar, there's no white lights allowed at night. Everything's red lights or no lights at all for force protection. And so I had this little bitty red lens light and follow the path out to the bathroom. I turn the corner around the plywood, and then my flashlight illuminates a pair of boots. And then it goes up a little bit, and then a pair of naked shins. And then the flashlight illuminates Captain Harwood's face. And he's on the middle tire. Here's me like, sir, what are you doing on the middle tire? Who does that? <laughs> Who sits on the middle tire? <laughs> sir, can I join you? Yeah, 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 Cassidy, have, have, have a seat. Here's me. Like, I got 35 minutes on. I got to do all those things still, and I have no option but to join him. So I sit down. I drop trowel. Knees are awkwardly touching. There's like one... <laughs> One smushed thing of mostly used toilet paper, and I see him trying to kind of like slide it towards him. Really super awkward. It was probably like 30 seconds at most, but to me it felt like 10 minutes where neither one of us are being very effective at what we're sitting there to do. And then all of a sudden, he turns to me sideways and looks at me and goes, hey, you know what I expect of you? And I really didn't know where he was going. I was like, <laughs> he goes, I expect you to make good decisions and bring the guys home safely. And right then and there, in that awkward, vulnerable position, it dawned on me, like, holy cow, the reason, the very essence that I'm getting paid by the United States government today and every day is to make good decisions and be a leader and, and bring people home safely. And... That lesson stuck with me all along. Like every single organization that we're a part of, whether it be as a student, as a faculty or staff, or as a, now I'm a civilian leader, it's all about making good decisions and doing the best you can for your organization. So I got to thank Captain Harwood for uh, giving me that lesson at that key moment in time. But that is a story that has oh. stuck with me on it for. A long, long time. So no middle tire. Is that where we're starting? Right? Yep. Okay, so Avoid the, the middle, middle tire. tire. Okay. That's the important point out of this story. Uh, no, I, sir, you learned this, and it you know, took you many years in your career to get this point across. But then when you became a leader for others, how did you communicate what you learned there to your people? Yeah, you know, I, um, I realized that I, as a SEAL, we train hard to uh, be very proficient with, it, with our weapons, to be fit and to um, do our job well, but those things are important. But I tried to convey to everybody in the unit that ultimately it's good head work, situational awareness, communication amongst the team, and just kind of being on the same page as you sort through those things that really is what sets a good unit apart. And, um, and trying to impart that message early on to, to our units was, was important. That's awesome. Great. That's great. Uh, Dr. Basic, Dr. Kevin, sorry. Thank you. Sorry, oh, got to correct right. myself. Right. Uh, first, could you pass me my water? Yes. Thanks. <laughs> uh, <laughs> do you think you could share a story of your own? Uh, I will. Um, you know, my dad said, if you're ever going to be doing public speaking, Two rules, just don't go after a Navy SEAL or an astronaut. Other than that, you'll be fine. So, <laughs> awesome! <All right. laughs> um, but actually, to piggyback on the decision um, process, the importance of that, and the role that you've got, and the fact that this journey never ends. I'm a young captain at Randolph Air Force Base, San Antonio, Texas, and I'm kind of killing it. I'm doing well. I know my stuff. We're moving the needle. I'm making good decisions. I got a good reputation. So I feel like, hey, this leadership thing, bring it on, man. On the money. Somebody knocks on my door. And it's a young first lieutenant, just came into our organization. He had been sent off to some specialized training for, for a, period, a good period of time to get deep in this certain technology that we really needed in our organization. So he comes back from that, and uh, he's put in charge of a team. And it's a team of a few enlisted folks, a lot of civilians, because that was kind of organization we were in. And many of the civilians were probably the age of his parents, for crying out loud. Mm -hmm. And the chief master sergeant from our organization was on his team, this, this first lieutenant. So he knocks on my door. Hey, Captain, can we talk? I, I really could use your help. He goes, uh, I, I appreciate uh, sort of what you do around here, and I need a mentor. And I'm thinking, bring it on. I'm so good at this stuff. You know, sit at my feet, and I will vomit jewels of wisdom. Bring it on, <laughs> right? <laughs> so he said, you know, I'm on this team. 
And I know exactly what to do. This is right in my wheelhouse. I've been training for this. So I got a vision. I know how to pull it off. But the chief is killing me. And I'm like, what do you mean? He goes, I don't know what it is. I don't know if he's got something out for me or what. But he just keeps making these comments. A lot of times under the umbrella of just we're kidding around, we're just smoking and joking or it's under his breath. But I can hear it. And the thread is always, what's this snot-nosed little kid really know? Really, like he should be the leader here? You know, comments like, oh, how many months in the Air Force did it take you to learn that? You know, that sort of And I'm like, the chief is saying stuff like that? He goes, I know, and I'm losing credibility with this team I'm trying to establish, and I know what I'm doing, but I also don't want to come back at the chief, and that's awkward, and I don't want to change the dynamics, so I'm coming to you for just some guidance. And I'm thinking, man, this is tough. I'm trying to wrap my head around how we navigate this. And he goes, and I'll be honest with you, sir, I didn't want to bring this up, but some of the comments even border on racist. And I'm like, Oh, come on, are you getting a little wrapped up in the emotion? He goes, for example, this, here, here's one of the things he said. It was under his breath, but I could hear it, and I'm like, it's pretty much racist. Like, what? What are you talking about? He goes, so I just, I need some help. I don't want to be running off to daddy to solve my problems, because that makes me look like a little kid. But this is also unacceptable, unprofessional. I'm trying to lead a team. What do you got? So I said, I tell you what, I'm about to go TDY, but when I come back, I mean, this is unsat. When I come back, I will engage, and I will talk to the chief. Or I tell you what, maybe I'll sit in on one of your meetings, and my presence may change the dynamic, or I could at least hear what's going on here and see it for myself. But, uh, you know, we're getting after this when I come back. So I go off on TDY. And in my gut, I'm thinking through this for the few days that I'm gone. I mean, this is an awkward conversation. It's chief master sergeant. I'm still just captain, and, you know, I want to be liked and all this. So I come back from TDY, and here's what I did. Here's what I did. Okay, you want to know? Here's what I did. I did nothing. I did nothing. I want to be liked. I don't want the awkward conversation. I don't know how to start this. I've never done anything like this before. I also know in the back of my head, in about six weeks, this sheep is going to PCS, and it all kind of goes away. And in my gut, I was trying to convince myself, oh, no, you're really going to do this, and you'll meet up. But, oh, the meeting just got out late, so i got to run to this thing, and he's about to go TDY, and maybe I'll meet up afterward. So it was always this very convenient opportunity for me to engage as the leader I said I wanted to be. And it just kept not happening. And then sure enough, six weeks passes. And this chief goes off PCSs. And this lieutenant takes over his team, gets them on the track. And they go off and do amazing things. No thanks to me. And it hit me. It took a little while for me to kind of stare in the mirror and recognize what I had just done because I had been feeling really good about the kind of leader I am. And to finally own the fact that, dude, when it got uncomfortable, you buckled. You talk a mean game until it got tough. And that ain't gonna keep, that's not going to stop. Moments like that are going to keep coming. I think it was uh, Martin Luther King once said, in the end, we will remember not so much the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. And that just hit me when I heard that, because I'm like, my silence spoke volumes about the type of leader I apparently really am, no matter what I was telling myself. So that, to me, was one of those moments. Because I didn't see that lieutenant a whole lot more. I was TDY a lot. But when I'd come back, and that chief was gone, and we'd sort of connect eyes, I could see in his eyes. You know what the phrase just sort of looked like in his eyes? I thought you were better than that. That's what it felt like coming back at me. I thought you were better than that. So I needed to come up with a battle cry or a phrase or something like that to get my butt out of the seat and have the tough conversations. Folks, all I can tell you is the tough conversations are coming with your peers, with your friends, and accountability and feedback, breaking up with people in your marriages, whatever. They're not going to stop being tough, but that's when you prove what kind of leader and person you really are. So... I appreciate so much that you like are able to reflect on yeah. the things that you regret that you didn't do because I've done a lot of reflecting recently on regrets and things but I think if we you know use that to build our leadership skills that's the yeah. only way to use it positively so you mentioned in there that you've got like a new mindset yeah. something to get you off your butt yeah, I'm glad, you, thing. I'm glad you said that. Yeah, because you can use this as fuel. So let's do jujitsu. Is that sick feeling in my stomach about, I can't believe I did that. Worst leadership moment of my life, honestly, is I just left this guy out there hanging when he said he needed me. So here's the thing. I've got a battle cry now. When I feel in my gut that this is coming, the battle cry is, 
No tough conversation gets better with age. Mm -hmm. Just, it's just, it's coming. It's tough and you feel it in your gut, but it's because you need to have it. So here's the, the hack. And this is just how it lands for Kevin. Deep breath, knock on the door, 11 seconds. And by deep breath, I mean, dude, if you know it's got to happen, stop trying to talk yourself out of it. Get off the seat, walk over. And while I'm walking to the door to knock on the door and start the conversation, I'm saying to myself, I guess we're doing this. I guess it's on. I guess we're really going to do this. Or I'm dialing the phone. It's ringing. That's the deep breath. Knock on the door. You can't unknock the door. And usually it's like, hey, I need to talk to you. There's something that, uh, that we need to address that I'm struggling with. Usually that's the foot in the door, mm -hmm. right? And then there's about 11 seconds where it's probably going to be awkward. And they go, yeah, what, what is it? And you stumble and you fumble and you bumble a little bit to, to put it out on the table. And after that 11 seconds, it's out there. And now we're just going to deal with it. And it, usually it turns out just fine and you can navigate through it. But you've got to be willing to own and take on the 11 seconds of awkwardness to be the person you're trying to be. So for me, deep breath, knock on the door, 11 seconds. I should write that down. I should write my notebook. Yeah, I'll write it afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> Astronaut Chris, uh, I'm going to bounce it back over to you. So nice. speaking about being out there, uh, do you think you could share your spacewalk story with us? <laughs> I would love to, actually. I would love to. And it, it'll, it'll uh, um, take longer than 11 seconds. But it is awkward. The, um, the, the spacewalks are, are a hard day. They're... Um, not something we do all the time. In a six-month mission, you feel lucky if you do one or two. So it's a big event for a, a crew or a person. And um, in 2013, my, my crewmate, Luca Parmitano, an Italian astronaut, he and I had a plan to do two spacewalks, one of which was uh, uh, the, the first one in the series happened, and everything went by the plan. They're generally six and a half or seven hours long. It's a full day, and the, the, the prep stuff in the morning takes four hours to get the suit on and get the gear and all that. And we went outside and did the spacewalk, and we came back inside at the end of that day, and, and when taking Luca's helmet off, he had a bunch of water on his head, and I was looking at him, and so was our crewmates, on, and said, hey, where'd that water come from? We sort of explained it. It must have been from his drink bag. We have a small camelback-sized bladder with us in the suit, and it was empty. His was. He didn't recall drinking at all. So we, we thought, okay, maybe the water leaked out of there and somehow made it to his head. And uh, we explained it, it that way and communicated with the, the ground teams, and, and they agreed with us. And so we proceeded on for, to do the second spacewalk five or six days later, um, and, and off, off we go. We do the whole morning of prep. We finally open the door. We're about 45 minutes into this, this spacewalk, and Luca gets an alarm on his spacesuit. And uh, it's a carbon dioxide level is high, the alarm says. And we know from years and years of operating these spacesuits that um, these carbon dioxide sensors inside the EMU, which is NASA lingo for spacesuit, um, they are very susceptible to moisture and, and water. And if you are working hard or breathing hard or sweating, that moisture can get into the lines and trigger a false alarm. So everybody's kind of a little bit leaning towards, okay, it's gonna be fake. And then there's a procedure on your wrist and you flip open to it and it says, um, if the reading is crazy high, like it's a gauge one through 10 and, it's, and it spikes instantly to 10, um, then it's pro and you feel, do you feel okay? Yes, then it's probably a false alarm. And that's exactly what it said. It was a false alarm and off we go. So five or six minutes later, Luca says, hey guys, I'm starting to feel, remember that water we had last week? I'm starting to feel a little bit on my head and I can see some of it in my helmet. And he described it as little balls of water kind of floating around inside his helmet. And, uh, and we were working and I was probably, from me to the flags away from, he and I were separated by about that distance, so I couldn't see his helmet. Um, and he's having the conversation, I fi finished up what I was doing, got close to him, and I could see like this jiggly ball of water about the size of half of a grapefruit or half a, so a softball, just kind of jiggling up by his head like jello. And 
the surface tension of the water keeps it nice and tight, but there were balls zinging around, like he said. Um, and we're having this conversation. Can you, what's it feel like? And he finally tasted one. And he said, oh, wow, it's super, super cold, and it tastes nasty. Well, sources of water inside a spacesuit are some basic biological ones. You, it could be urine. It could be sweat. It could be the drink bag that we drink from. All of those three things, how cold do you think those are? Yeah. Not cold. They're body temperature fluids. So the only other source of water is the technical water in the backpack of the spacesuit that is used to cool, um, cool your body. Imagine you put a heavy Gore-Tex jacket on, you run around in the summertime, you build up a bunch of heat. Well, we have to take that heat out of the spacesuit, and we do it with this water flowing through our long underwear. And there's a connection where, they, where the, the tubes, tubes meet. So we thought, oh, and as soon as he said that, I knew right away, okay, this is not good. This is a, a technical problem, not a, oh, geez, we should, we should uh, keep on going. And we shifted focus. In my brain, I was kind of like, okay, well, the ground team, the, the mission folks are going to say, talk about it and weigh the risks and then tell us, okay, just continue on. It's, we think you're safe. But it shifted from this kind of, aw shucks, we're a little bit behind schedule to, oh, wow, we, we probably should end this spacewalk and go back in. And there's, there's in, in NASA jargon, there's sort of three ways you can end a spacewalk. Nominally, which is everything's fine, you're done with your jobs and you go home. Um, you can terminate, which means, hey, we think this is sort of bad, we don't know why it's bad, uh, but we should end right now, but it's not super critical, it's not emergent, nobody's going to die, tidy up what you're doing, finish your last job, and then make your way back to the airlock. Or abort, which means drop everything, doesn't matter where your stuff is, get your butts back to the airlock, and get inside and start getting safe. Well, we decided as a group, the group being Luca, myself, and the Mission Control Center, hey, this is probably a terminate. It's not quite life or death, but it's, we don't know what it is, so let's just get back. They said, Luca, you head on back to the airlock. Chris, you finish up cleaning up and making the equipment safe and, uh, and, and get back that way. Well, on a spacewalk, um, much like rock climbing, we, wear, we use safety tether lines that are connected with a big hook back to the entrance of the airlock. And if you've ever walked two dogs, do the leashes stay separate? No, they turn and tangle all over the, themselves, right? So to prevent this, we intentionally take different paths from the airlock to the place where you're going to go, kind of like this auditorium, one person would go up that aisle and one person would go up that aisle, just to keep the lines separate. So when Luca went to go back, it was, it was sunny, and when you're in space, you're orbiting the Earth every 90 minutes, 45 minutes in the sun, 45 minutes in the dark. We were having this whole conversation in the daytime, and then right when he went to go back, the sun set, Ooh. and it became dark. And you guys will soon learn that problems in your operational careers, they take place at the fold of a map, at the intersection of two grid squares at night, you know, that whole situation, and that's exactly what this was stacking up to be. Now that the sun set, and Luca starts to leave around the corner, and to this day I have this image of Luca's silhouette going around the backside of the space station and, and me seeing him disappear and this pit in my stomach. Yeah. Like, mm. this is the essence of teamwork. This is the essence of buddies. That's why we're out here together, yeah. is to be together when we need each other. And here I am cleaning up some silly bag and my partner is leaving me to go back to the air. Like, he probably had 100 yards to go by himself. And all in the process of a few seconds, I thought, okay, well, this is a horrible feeling. It's icky feeling. I don't think I should be here. But I knew that if, I, if we went back together, one of our safety tethers would have to be left out, right? I would have to switch over and hook onto him, and we would go together, or he hooks onto me, and we go together and the other line would be left strung out, and it was across equipment that should be reactivated, spinning equipment and things that they shut down for the duration of a spacewalk. So knowing the space station systems, I was like, okay, that's not so good. Maybe we'll just hustle back, and if I get back to the airlock before Luca is there, then I'll retrace his tether and find him. So all that goes through my head. All right, let's just leave the plan as it is. Luca's this very strong confident Italian test pilot, 
and he normally sounds that way. He got about halfway back, nighttime on the backside of the space station, where the water now, that was a jiggly ball up by his head, now that he starts to move and the momentum goes into the water, the water swooshed around his, oh, no. his face, got in his ears, we have microphone booms right here and the water's over the booms, so sometimes he could talk in, uh, like that. And, all, and you could hear sort of a different mindset that Luca had as he realized, wow, this is really getting serious. So we, we hustled back, I hustled back to the airlock just as he's getting there, and I remember thinking, what do my hands need to do right now to make this problem better? Because problems, I didn't think this at the time, but now I think if problems never get super, super good really fast, but they sure can go to heck in a handbasket <laughs> in a blink of an eye. And um, I remember thinking, what do I need to do to make this problem even or better? And um, the weird part is, and this is the, this is the story, the, 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 the part where training takes, takes place. Mm. We spend so much time in our military careers training and training and rehearsing and doing again, and sometimes you think, why? Well, this is why. When I got to the airlock, I don't remember doing anything. Like, I can't even sequence it in my head, but somehow he got in, we got the hatch closed because there's nothing that mattered, nothing else mattered at that time other than getting the hatch closed. Because if we don't get the hatch closed, we can't put air pressure back in the airlock. And if we can't get air pressure back in the airlock, we can't get Lucas' helmet off. If we can't get Lucas' helmet off, he's going to drown inside his helmet. Uh, so we get back in and open the valve, and the I do remember the needles start to move, and we got pressure, and then we were able to um, get, to, get to a point where, where we could get Lucas' helmet off safely, and, and he lived. But the takeaways from the, the story, I'm often asked, what would you do different? And this is, this is where leadership comes in, because leadership is leadership and followership. And leadership is also you together, it was Luca and I together, but also with this entity on the ground called the Mission Control Center, where together we were making decisions, but we all led ourselves down a path where we kept on thinking everything was okay. Last week, there was evidence of water that we normally didn't see. Early in the spacewalk, there was an alarm that went off that we blew off because we've seen it before. And, and Luca disappears around the corner of the space station and I know I should be with him, but I didn't say it. I didn't vocalize it. It should, I should, to this day, I regret not saying, hey, hey, stop, stop, Luca, wait. Hey, Houston, we're going to leave this tether right where it is. We'll deal with it later, but I need to be with Luca. Mm -hmm. and, and it's those feelings. It's kind of like I did nothing. Yeah. It's, a, it's a gut. And, and the takeaway for me, and hopefully for you, is if your gut is telling you that something isn't right, you're right. Something isn't right. Um, but, and we got lucky. Training kind of carried, carried the water, helped us get back in safely. The, the, um, Luca being a talented person enough to navigate his way back to the airlock in the pitch dark with water in his eyes. Uh, so all of those things allowed it to have the story to have a happy ending. But listen to your gut and vocalize and speak up when you know something isn't, isn't right. I'm hearing in your story, just when, when you told... I should have told Houston, we're going to knock it off. I need to be with him right now. We'll get back to the, you know what I was hearing? I was hearing mental health stuff. That, that is also, yep. that's a great analogy for there's something going on in their life. I need to be there. And I'm going to set this aside right now because in my gut, it's clear to me they need, they need help. So I, I never heard, thought through that when you were telling that story before. Mm -hmm. you, you heard something too. Yeah, well, you're such a good storyteller, sir. Like the, the feeling in your gut, I'm feeling it myself just listening to your story. Um, but like what I'm hearing is you talking about the decision action gap. Oh, that, amen. So you guys know the leader character framework, right? And the ARDA model that we learn in CE lessons and stuff like that? This guy yeah. was one of the co-authors yeah. of that. No, so you can thank him. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Hey, there, there it is. is. <laughs> well, that the red box right there, I think that's what we're capturing with all of these stories is yeah. you can make a decision and really only through training can you get to the actual action to get to the point where you've made the decision, now I'm going to get that done. I love it. Right. Love it.
And, I think and let me just add, I, I think that fear is caused by unknowns. Mm. And when you can train something, that's a, a th something that mitigates unknowns and yeah. therefore helps with, with fear. Uh, same thing with maybe you rehearse a tough conversation in your yeah. head before you do it. It tamps down the unknowns. You've thought what, how it could go, and, and all that helps reduce fear. And I tell you, I mean, this, this we just came up. Folks, every word up here has been thought through deeply, and so much focus is put on this side over here because this is the identity that we say, if you're part of this school, you come through here, people are going to assume you've been practicing that. You just live by a certain code that, that you are concerned about other people and try to lift people up and that you advance the mission and you just have a bias for making things better. That's part of the deal and people are going to assume that when the testable moments come, that's just natural to you, but it's only natural if you've been practicing this. So in your story, what I loved was you said, what do my fingers have to do? I really, hopefully it's so deeply ingrained, I don't even think about it. It just happens because this moment, there's so much at stake right now. And it's that gap of all this that you better own it. You're past the time of rented values. Your values better be owned. Your, your first story, the bathroom with the crapper in Kandahar, it was a, a commander going, you better realize people are coming home either in, on flight seats, on jump seats, or in body bags based on how you make decisions. If that doesn't lock you in to own this brother, mm -hmm. and if you're not sure about that, buckle up. And for me, it was a moment of failure that reminded me, Kevin, if you seriously want to be a certain type of leader, you better own it and be better than what you were. And then somehow we arm ourselves in the life hacks or tips or tricks or examples or things like this to engage in and add to our toolkit. But the whole reason we do that is because of that decision action gap right there. Yeah. Because it's freaking hard. It's when the moment shows up, that's when the peer pressure shows up. That's when the insecurity, that's when the fear, the time constraints, the uncertainty, the insecurity, all that stuff shows up to push you away from stepping across that gap to be who you say you're going to be. Yeah. And uh, I mean, your, your story right there is I want to be a better teammate than that. Luckily, I've built habits of excellence to pull this off. Yeah. So amen on that. All right, we want to give you guys okay. some time for Anything questions. Anything else you want to add before we do Q&A? No, let's just get right. after it. Any yeah. questions? Go ahead up to the mics and then we'll call on you one by one. Anything? Come on, you got an astronaut and a Navy SEAL? And, then, and, the then other, and the guy. other guy. So. And the other guy. So. <laughs> yeah. Hello. Hi. Um, Cadet De Villiers, Squadron 31. Um, so you briefly mentioned at the end about these habits of excellence that can help you basically close that gap. So from both of you, what would be like the most important habit that you've built in your career that you feel has made being a leader of this character easy for you? Habits to close the gap. Oh, uh, habits, yeah, well, habits yeah. for your leadership. For me, it's simple, listen. You know, it, everybody in an organization feels like they have, um, if their voice can be listened to, it, whether, they, it's, whether it's acted upon or not, I think is, is in organizations I've been a part of, if I've felt or the people have felt like we can all have provide input openly and it's listened to, that's all I'm asking for, so listening. That's a, that's a great habit. That is a great habit. The other habit that I've had early on in my career, actually, when I started at prep school, I went to Northwestern Prep, um, um, and, and all the way through, I've, I've built a routine of, at certain transition points in my life, I'll sit down and I'll write a letter to myself, and I will say, in this season of my life, whose opinions of how I live and lead matter, and what do I want them to, what would I love to overhear them say about me at the end of this? So I'm sort of creating what's the, the quote from their eyes I want? And for me, what it is, is it's me on that right side of the gap going, who am I committed to being in these key relationships? Because life or God or the cosmos or whatever you believe in is gonna go, oh, seriously, that's who you're trying to be? Here's a moment, let's see if you're serious. Mm -hmm. And you wanna be a present and engaged dad? Here's a job that's gonna challenge that. You want to be a, a good listener? You want to be an empowering boss? Here's a challenge where there's a lot at, at stake. So getting clear on who you're trying to be in certain key relationships, I think, helps turn the dashboard lights a little bit brighter. Thank you. Great question. Yeah, that was awesome. I got a question for you while we're waiting for somebody. So when you had the, the tough boss, 
you know, that he was just a jerk and he chewed up and spit out people and all that. Did you see him differently after that, you know, assignment, deployment, that all of a sudden maybe not a jerk, but just high standard that you sort of recalibrated or reappreciated? Yeah, I mean, it's, you, you, your lead into the question is exactly how I felt. And my initial uh, feeling towards him was a little bit of resentment and, hey, come on, back off. Yeah. But knowing that he upped my game and he elevated me to be a better briefer, a better performer, a better SEAL, a better officer, um, I had a great deal of appreciation for him. Probably a, not very much unlike a tough set of, a, a professor that has really tough problem sets makes you a better physics student, for example, you know, same exact thing. At the end, you can look back and realize the value. Yeah, yeah, yeah. your heart was in the right place. Mm. What you got? Hello, Cadet Third Class, uh, Trevor May from Cadet Squadron 22. Um, it seems like, you know, like the big highlight of that story with the chief and stuff, it was kind of like intimidation by rank. And, you know, even though you outrank him, it's like there's a certain gap of like, you know, the highest enlisted member or whatever. Um, how has that experience like helped you in having those hard conversations? Because I know like it's, you know, everyone here is like, if you're not a cadet, you're like lieutenant colonel or higher, right? Yeah. So how has that been like being able to do the right thing? Yeah even when the member is like higher ranking than you by tenfold. Yeah, because at, again, at the gap, the, part of the pressure is the narrative you're telling yourself. Oh God, there's this whole thing and who am I? I'm the new guy or I'm, I'm only this rank or whatever. What I found is a vulnerability, a gesture of vulnerability. First of all, vulnerability is sort of the point of entry for trust. In psychology, we call it the normal of reciprocity. You make a gesture, the other person sort of responds in kind. Sometimes what it sounds like is, hey, I'm struggling with this and I can use your help. That, I mean, who doesn't appreciate sort of being invited in there? Um, you know, Cur Colonel, I, um, I find myself kind of confused or frustrated about something and I think maybe you could help out with that. Even with a peer, hey, I want to put something on the table that I'm struggling with and I don't think it's even on your scope, so maybe we can talk through that. So it's sort of that... I, I'm, I need some help, and I could appreciate here that that sometimes brings the power differential out of equation, and it starts a trust exchange that maybe can help the, help the outcome. Thank you very much. Good question. Anything else? Got time for maybe one more question. There he is, the man. Yep. All right. You got it. <laughs> Hi, Cadet Second Class Daniel Joseph. Um, so, thanks, guys. Uh, so both of you have mentioned the importance of feedback and listening to your people. Um, what, I guess two questions. One, what would be um, one method of providing feedback when you guys were followers that you felt was most effectful? Um, and secondly, um, as commanders, what was one way of soliciting feedback that you also found particularly fruitful? I'd love to hear the SEAL. What's it like to give feedback Get, to SEALs? Yeah, so actually that's a great question because Leading SEALs is, was, I found it to be a bit of a challenge when I first got there, felt overwhelmed, I felt like the, the first lieutenant, like uh, in your story, yeah. with decades of, of experienced SEALs, then now I'm in charge of them. And to try to feel comfortable giving feedback was an, I found to be a very awkward situation early, early in my career. Um, but I think that everybody in the military understands military rank and structure. And, there are some, maybe some outliers and some, some yeah. that will, don't fall into that category. But I think people, if, as long as it, you, they feel like you're telling honest, straightforward feedback, you're gonna be respected. And not, it's tough, and that's the tough conversation to not beat around the bush, yeah. and you got that awkward 11 seconds. I, I love that 11 seconds thing, by the way, because it's very true. Yeah. It's awkward, and then you get through it, but what the delivery being from the heart, sincere, honest, where the person really is like, I get it. I understand. Thank you for that feedback. I felt that that to be the most uh, effective for me, delivering and receiving. I'll, I'll throw one more thing in there is, um, uh, and I'll give you a little bit of a framework for it too. Sometimes you're about to give feedback and you don't have the whole story, but you think you do, right? You're about to come down on somebody or correct them or call them out on something, and there might be another side to the story that if only you knew it, you would change how you act. And I learned this when I was teaching cadets here back. I was teaching in DFBL. And uh, I about came down with the atomic elbow on a guy who seemed to deserve it. And thanks to Jeff Nelson, a mentor, a previous uh, boss of mine, he offered me this framework. Hey, help me understand what I'm seeing. It looks like this. I got to tell you, it's coming across this way. 
and here, here comes, there's, there's a lot of signs here. It's coming across this way, but I know that's not you. Okay, you're just protecting the ego a little bit. And it's unfair to you if I miss this. So I want to give you an opportunity to just help round this out for me. So help me understand what I'm seeing. It looks like this, but that's not you. And it's unfair to you if I miss this. So what is it? And every time I've slowed the train down and offered that up, usually there was a piece mm. of the puzzle that I was missing. And if I was going through what they were going through, now that I know it, I would have probably been acting the same way that they acted. And I almost, good grief, one of the cadets, I almost came down on him. He said, sir, I understand how what I just did looked like it was disrespectful and I wasn't engaged in class and you expected me to after all you've invested into me. But I found out last night my mom's got cancer. And I'll be honest with you, nothing else seems important right now. That's why I wasn't present in your class today. So uh, she's everything to me and I don't know what to do. And I thought, oh dear Lord, what I almost did to this kid by just coming down, because I would have lectured him like you lecture cadets. We're gonna talk about discipline and respect and officership. And, and he would have nodded his head. Yes, sir, yes, sir. And with every nod, I would become less and less of the leader he needed in that moment. But mm -hmm. because of that just little framework, hey, help me understand, there's probably more here and it's unfair to you if I miss it. He shared that with me and all of a sudden it went from this to this. What, I've never gone through what you're going through. You tell me what you need right now and I got your back. And now I'm starting to show up as the leader that I wanted to be. And it was in the context of a feedback session, but I didn't have actually all the information. So just a little nugget to think about. Thank you. Uh, it's time. All right. Thank you both for joining us today. I, I can't think of a better way to transition to our 2023 NCLS theme of leadership, teamwork, and organizational management. So on behalf of the entire cadet wing, please accept a token of our appreciation. Blacks. Black. I don't know where the camera yeah, is. Camera. Camera. It's All Dr. Right. Johnson. <laughs> At this time, the session is concluded. Cadet wing, you're dismissed. Thanks, everybody. Peace. Thank you. Thank you.